One scene in the film On the Beat created a particular challenge. This man he was going to play the crook was very fey. And I had to teach Norman how to walk with his hand on his hip and do it. And when we did it, because I had to do this, and it was hysterical. As you put your foot forward, yeah. you let your weight rest onto it so that your hip swings outwards. Oh, yeah, yeah. You then change feet. That is to say, you tread on the other one, transferring the weight in exactly the same manner. Now, this you continue to do alternately. Now, have He walked behind me, and of course, he yes. tripped out. Uh, and the producer yes. took us both outside the studio, no. and he said, you two have got to get yourself together. It's costing me so many thousands a minute. I said to Norman, look, you're a star, you can do this. It's my living, you know. He said, all right, yeah. I said, can you do it? Can you get through the scene? Yes. No, hand shoulder high. We came in, I said, right, action. And we did it, and then as we did it, we fell on one side, screaming of laughter, and Asher was on the floor with a handkerchief in his mouth. But we got the scene. Oh, sir, he's fabulous! Can I get my uniform now, sir? By all means. Oh, thank you, sir. <laughs> we come to the fact that Norman was a little man with a giant ego, which is what I always think. But he, he was big in as much as he did what he bloody wanted to do. And nobody would ever tell Norman. He would do the most daring things. Oh, yeah. I heard the result of the two o'clock on the radio, so I had to come. You know, I'm excited, isn't it? We're absolutely hysterical, aren't we, Mr. Abbott? Norman used to disappear. We'd be out shooting on location somewhere. And and director said, we'll get Norman now. We'll do scene 42. And they said, well, no, where's Norm? Where is Norman? Norman nobody could find him. And they had megaphones almost in those days. They used to scream, right <laughs> where? Norman! <laughs> He'd gone. He disappeared. I mean, absolutely. There is no other person I've ever worked with that would have got away with that. This is the BBC Home Service. Throughout the 1950s and 60s, Norman was one of the nation's best-loved film stars, seldom off the national news. He was also in great demand as a variety performer. Wherever he went in public, he would appear in character, demonstrating the remarkable dexterity which had long become his trademark. I thought he was a bit of a nutter, frankly, when I first met him. I think we all did, really. Certainly, if there's one pair of eyes watching him, he's performing. He's a, he just entertains instinctively. Uh, he, he, that's who he is. If you're there, he's got to make you laugh. One would call him a comic, really. Comic mover. Uh, an ability to you know, look as though he was going to kill himself by falling over, and he, he lands up um, like a cat does, you know, unhurt. I mean, the last time I had, I had breakfast with him, it was about sort of 8 o'clock in the morning, I, I went down and Norman was just going into the, into the restaurant, and it was one little step, so he obviously done his little fall, got up, come to the table, and he'd already been for a four-mile walk. Norman always maintained his fitness, and on camera, he endeavoured to perform his own stunts, however demanding or bizarre. On one occasion, much to Norman's disappointment, a stuntman was booked to perform an ambitious scene. On the first take, the stuntman broke his arm. The film star cheerfully stepped in. The result in the 1963 film, A Stitch in Time, is pure Norman wisdom. Fit 
Kid will be disappointed he missed all the excitement. I remember, like, holding myself, watching the scene. It was unbelievable. So calm, so corny. But, God, the way he pulled it off, it was brilliant, absolutely brilliant. And it takes a lot, it takes a lot for me to laugh out loud. It really, really does. <laughs> but honestly, I used to just scream laughing at him, you know. Mm. I love him, I love the man. Afternoon. What's he doing out of bed? He walked and he jogged and he rode his bike and this helped him with his act as well because he learned how to tumble and how to fall without hurting himself. And one of the lines he used to use in his concert uh, was that he just used to think of the money and he was okay. The big revelation I had about him was this thing of thinking he was a bit of a twit. He wasn't and it, it was when you realised this, when you started to work with him and talk to him, uh, you realised, he, although he was a sort of loner in a way, he, he was a very bright man and uh, was quite able. And uh, probably from his background, he had to be. He had to be a bright man to cope. What a delightful little fella. <laughs> Behind Norman's huge success lay a complex private life. Married briefly and divorced in his 20s, age 32, Norman proposed to his second wife, Frida, on Bournemouth Pier. As a young army man, Norman had resumed contact with his mother. Though the family were rarely gathered together, here they all are. His mother, Maud, his brother, Fred, whom he'd lost contact with for 16 years at Norman's wedding to Frieda in 1947. Norman knew the value of forgiveness. Despite his troubled upbringing, he embraced Maud into his life. His mother and brother died in the same year, 1971. Frieda and Norman had two children, Nick and Jackie. Growing up with Norman Wisdom as your dad was as much fun as you might imagine. He wasn't really a disciplinarian, it was my mother was a disciplinarian, but she really was never going to win because, I mean, we'd have tea and he'd put the dog on the table. <laughs> you know, the dog's coming on the, to have tea with us, you know, and she'd just sort of shake her head, you know. I can remember when I was little, my mum was taking me up to the, the flat in London and I love after eight minutes and dad knew exactly what I would do because as soon as we got into the flat I make a little beeline for the sweet tray in in the lounge and there is sitting an after eight you know box and I just open it up and on the top is a little note that dad's written and it just says I'm watching you Jackie and the whole box went flying up in the air and I just ran out of the room screaming my head off because I was convinced he was hiding behind a curtain or something. So he did love to tease. To his children, he was both father and film star. They grew up watching him on the set, even managing to get in on the act in Follow a Star. I think it was 1959, I just played the piano. Well, I didn't play it, I pretended to have a piano lesson. <laughs> That's all, thank you, Nicholas. Same time. But very exciting going to Pyramid Studio. Everybody wanted to be on the Norman Wisdom set. <laughs> Mum said, Jackie, why don't you go along and, you know, sit on the stool in front of the piano? So I said, OK. And, and then they started, you know, action. And Hattie Jakes came in. Judy, Judy, read this. But they'd actually muted the, the the piano, so when you played, no sound came out. So I just went, Mum, this piano doesn't work. Cut. It's outrageous. You know, I kept on turning round and looking at Hattie Jakes, and they had to cut again because they were saying, Jackie,